Panorama TV presents How They Do That, where we explore the world of professional photographers and share their techniques with you. Here's your host, Mark Wallace. Hey everybody, welcome to another How They Do That. We have a very special guest on the show today. Her name is Kale Alford. Kale is a photojournalist and her work is focused on culture, politics, and conflict in the Middle East and the Balkans. Her work has been shown in many U.S. and European magazines, including Time, Newsweek, U.S. News and World Report, The Guardian, The New York Times, Times London, Vanity Fair, and many others. Kale covered the U.S. invasion of Iraq until 2004 as an unembedded journalist, and that work led to a book and exhibition entitled Unembedded for Independent Journalists on the War in Iraq. Kale is currently working on a multimedia project on the coastal erosion in southeastern Louisiana, and she is a Neiman Journalism Fellow at Harvard University. Welcome to the show, Kale. Hi, thanks for having me. Well, we're very, very glad to have you here. Well, we want to start by talking about your work in Iraq. And so to begin with, can you explain what unembedded means and how you went to Iraq? Working unembedded means you travel without the assistance of the U.S. military. So when I worked in Iraq, I traveled among Iraqi people, sort of ordinary civilians, and I, I wasn't officially embedded as part of the U.S. military's embedded journalism program. Um, so that's how we, we came up with the name of that project, and it was the, the mode I decided to work in, in Iraq. And I, I went there and worked this way because I really felt like there wasn't going to be enough coverage of that perspective. I knew that journalists were getting fairly easy access to the mil U.S. military thanks to the Unembedded program, but they, there weren't so many journalists sort of just traveling among Iraqi civilians. Well, let's talk about some of the practical aspects of your work in Iraq. So could you tell us a little bit about the gear that you use, the cameras and bags and things like that? How did you work in Iraq? Well, I was working with Nikon equipment at the time. I just recently switched to Canon, uh, reluctantly, but I was working with Nikon gear at that time. And I had a, a Nikon D1X, I believe, was the body I used. I probably had uh, a... a second, yes, I had a second backup body. I used like a small Olympus point-and-shoot camera, um, a camera they don't make anymore, because I, I wanted also to have a smaller body that was a little less obvious and um, not so obtrusive. So I had those two bodies. So, and were those bodies, are they digital cameras or film cameras? They were both digital cameras. At that point, I had really just completed making a full transition to digital photography, and it was really much more practical for working that way um, in, a, in a place where you know, I couldn't, there was no way I was going to be able to process film in Baghdad and you know, everything was closed during the bombing. I got there before the U.S. led invasion and everything shut down. So uh, I really had to be able to function digitally and upload my photographs either through the internet, which was how I, I worked initially, and then later through sat phones. Well, the last time you and I spoke, it was face to face in Phoenix, Arizona. I believe it was 2006. You were here doing an exhibition of Unembedded. Um, and we went out to dinner after, and you uh, and I had a conversation that I remember very clearly, and it was about the difference between taking a photo and making a photo. Can you tell us the difference between taking and making a photograph? Well, I think, um, you know, it's kind of a, it's a funny distinction that I, I make as just sort of a way to describe um, how people ought to, how photojournalists in particular ought to be working with the people they photograph. I'm not sure what I said then, <laughs> but what I would say now. Um, during our conversation now is I, I feel like it's important that people really journalists develop relationships with the people they photograph and you know we're not in a position to sort of barge into a situation and take something away from it very quickly I think when we work like that the perspective we get is very shallow we don't get a kind of depth that comes from taking our time and, and reporting um, through building relationships with people and learning something about their situation. So I, I would say the difference between making a photograph and taking one um, is simply the amount of time that we spend with our subjects and how thoughtful we are in the way that we frame our pictures and the way we inform our photographs. It's very insightful. So let's talk about a couple of the photos that you made in Iraq. The first one is this photo of a man holding up his arm with a child in his other arm. It looks like he's trying to cross the street. Can you tell us about that photo and how you made that? That photograph, it, there's actually a very long backstory to that, that photograph, and I'll, I'll try to condense it. But that picture was made in the city of Najaf in the south of Iraq at the end of 2004, or really the late summer of 2004. 
And there was a, an uprising, a sort of pitched, that ended in a pitched battle between the U.S. Um, military and the Sadr Army Militia, which was a militia of Muqtada al-Sadr, who is now a very important um, political figure in Iraq. And they were a resistance group, um, a Shia resistance group, and Najaf is sort of the, it's like the Shia Mecca in the Muslim world. It's a very important shrine in Najaf called the Shrine of Imam Ali. And so the, these fighters had withdrawn to Najaf and were sort of using the shrine as their base of operations in a way. At least they were sleeping there, they were eating there. They weren't storing their weapons in the shrine, but they were using it as shelter. And they had taken control of the area of the city around the shrine, which is a very important tourist destination in Iraq and an important religious um, place. And the U.S. military had surrounded them, so there were these fighters in the center of the city with the U.S. military um, surrounding them on all sides. And we, as journalists, were trying to reach the center of that shrine and to, so we could photograph from the militant's point of view. And, and that's important for me, that we are able, as journalists, to show all sides of the story, including people who are perhaps even fighting against our own country, uh, in this case, since I'm an American. So we found, after some negotiation, that there may be an opportunity for us to cross that front line. I rallied a group of journalists. We went down to the U.S. military headquarters in, in Najaf, and we asked them if they would please hold their fire at 2 o'clock in the afternoon so we could cross with a convoy of journalists to get into the shrine and have a press conference with the militant leaders who were, who were based there. And so the U.S. military said, you're crazy, but okay, we'll see what we can do. And um, so we all lined up at 2 o'clock in the afternoon the next day. We had contacted the leaders inside the shrine, um, the leaders of the militia, and we told them that we were coming. And uh, when we got to the first, the sort of the last uh, U.S. military position before the sort of no man's land between the military, the U.S. military and the militants inside, um, we stopped there at that last American position and said, you know, you must know we're coming. We told the, your commanders that we would be here, and they said, we have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> but they held their fire, they sort of co communicated among all the other frontline positions, and they held their fire so we could cross the front line and get inside the shrine. So we spent a couple of hours there and then left as, uh, before it got dark. But that opened a kind of uh, avenue. It allowed us to travel between the two sides for the next couple of weeks because both sides expected to see us. They knew journalists were in town. They knew how we dressed. And um, so that photograph there was made after I crossed that line for the day. I would cross in the morning and return at night. During this, there was really a pitched battle going on, but we would cross back and forth. So I crossed into the, into the um, Sadr militia side of things. And I was photographing the few civilians who remained inside the city, inside this, this encirclement of U.S. troops, where there was really heavy fighting. So that man is crossing the street with his child after a night of heavy bombardment. And he's trying to get out of the center of the city to a safer side of the city, past where all this fighting is, is happening. So he's crossing a road that is um, patrolled on either side by snipers. There's American snipers on one side and the Iraqi militant snipers on the other side. And he's got his hand in the air to let both sides know he's a civilian and he's trying to get his child out of the city. So I followed him as he crossed the street. Well, that photo, it sounds like when you made that photo, a lot of the um, work that you did had really nothing to do with the camera or the lens that you used. How much of uh, photojournalism photojournalism is just that. It's work that's uh, preparation and hard work that is totally outside the bounds of actually snapping a photo. Yeah, that's absolutely how photojournalism works. A lot of what we do is reporting. We work as reporters. We find where we should be, where we should physically be to tell our stories. We get access to those stories. Sometimes it takes, it can take months to get access to a story. Um, and in that case, it took, you know, really a couple of months in Iraq of learning where I was and who was who and who could, I could trust. And, and ultimately, it took all of that preparation and groundwork before I knew what might be possible in that situation. So, um, yeah, a lot of what we do, do as photojournalists is groundwork and preparation just so we can be in the right place at the right time and be prepared. 
Well, we recently interviewed another photojournalist by the name of Kelly Kerr, who is now a, an instructor at Oklahoma University. And he said that some of his students, many of his students, in fact, don't do the mental exercises that they need to do to become f successful photojournalists. Um, and so I was just wondering if you have some mental exercises or things that you do outside of the world of just uh, using your aperture and shutter and ISO, things like that, to prepare yourself to become a better photojournalist. That's an interesting question. I've never thought of it in terms of mental exercises. Um, I sort of think about what I do in terms of a, a sort of a way, an approach to the world and a way of thinking about the world. I, when I read the news, I try to look for what's missing, what part of the story doesn't make sense to me, uh, what perspective perhaps is being overlooked in the day-to-day -day news reporting. And then those are the stories that I feel drawn to as a journalist. So a lot of it is sort of how I approach the world in that way. And then after that, I would say, um, when I'm working on a new story, I read a lot about the issue, about the place. I, I read literature. I read history. Um, I try to place myself in the place where I'm going to work before I get there. And of course, once I do arrive, particularly if it's somewhere I've never been before, um, a lot of the learning just happens on the ground, you know, I mean, there, there's a lot you can only learn about a place by being there. So when I am there in a place, I try to be open to the perspectives around me and spend a lot of time with people, not only photographing, but just talking to them, seeing what's important to them, uh, having some social interaction, like normal human social interaction with people, so that I can make sense of where I am. Well, tell us a little bit about that, because now you've shifted and you've been working for a few years in southeast Louisiana talking about uh, coastal erosion. So tell us a, bit, a little bit about that work, how it began and what you're doing now. The work I'm doing in Louisiana is about really about coastal erosion and it's a different approach to photography than I've taken in the past. Uh, there it's a it's a very quiet, long, slow story about how coastal erosion affects these communities. And the coastal erosion is caused by the intervention of the oil and gas industry when they cut canals across the wetlands to explore for oil and gas it allowed salt water into those wetlands and it causes the, the, the very soil to wash away at a very alarming rate so the, it's a long slow process and there's nothing really to show there's very little action I can show so I decided then I would just spend time in these communities and show what daily life was like for these people and how dependent they were on this land and this environment and if coastal erosion continues at the rate it's it's been occurring in the past and actually it's only accelerating then these communities will be underwater in 50 years they won't even exist anymore a lot of these communities in very uh, vulnerable places so while I'm working on this project for a couple of years um, then the oil spill happened and that has this is like a new story in the middle of all the, all of this long-term research and long-term work so tell us a little bit about um, the access you have to these people in these communities. Um, and you know, you spent years there. Is there a benefit to long-form photojournalism, and does that relate to access to communities and people and, and approachability? Yeah, I spent so much time there um, for a couple of reasons. One, my grandmother was born on the coast of Louisiana, and this part of the country is part of my family's history. So I was really just exploring for my own interest this place and then I realized that there was this important story there as well um, and I was kind of personally attached to it so what I decided to do was just to return as often as I could and document this way of life and the in the beginning it was surprisingly difficult to get access there people have been barraged with media attention each time a hurricane comes they get journalists come around and the federal government comes around and all these outsiders come into these remote places and um, the people who lived there were kind of distrusting of outsiders. So it, it took me, I would say, almost two years before people would even let me into their homes, which I've, I've never really had that experience before. Um, and returning there again and again hasn't had a big impact on the work. Now people welcome me there, and um, now that there's this terrible other story, this oil spill, I find that I have a relationship with the community that they trust and they can believe in. They understand what I'm doing. They've seen photographs. I've given people pictures. I've shown them film work I've done. So now it feels much more like a collaboration, I would say, than anything I've done in the past. So you've been there for years. How do you fund that? Oh, how do I fund this? Yeah, it's a good question. How do I fund this work after, 
uh, over the period of, of years. And it, I have to say the funding always comes from different sources. Sometimes, initially it was my own funding. I, for, for at least a year I spent my own money on this work. Um, with the faith that at some point I would find other support. So I would talk about the work and I would show it around and at some point a, a museum curator at the High Museum of Art in Atlanta, a curator named Julian Cox, he, he saw a presentation I gave and approached me and said that there was a commission series at the museum that I might be interested in. So that became a really nice collaboration between me and the High Museum of Art in Atlanta and that's what's funded the work really for the last um, two years or so. And there'll be an ex exhibition there uh, in 2012. So that is how this work came to be funded. And even, even with all of that great support, I still need more funding if I'm going to put the time and energy into the work I would like to, to, give, to give to it. So, so now I'll be selling some of the work that isn't going towards the commission, some of the other sort of peripheral work will be, um, will be going towards some commissions or publications for magazines or various um, organizations. That is, again, really, really interesting because uh, of all the people that write in and ask about how they can become photojournalists, very few, I think, understand the commitment that it takes as far as reading, doing research, getting an education, finding funding, establishing a communication with local uh, groups, things like that, and just doing the footwork before you ever click the shutter on your camera. So this is really, really interesting. Well, speaking of that, we have a lot of questions from people asking how they can become uh, photojournalists. And I know you just got back from Istanbul. Can you tell us a little bit about what you were doing there? So uh, recently in Istanbul, I was, I was working as an instructor for the Foundry Photojournalism Workshop, which is a collection of, vo of volunteers, a really wonderful collection of volunteer instructors and organizers who are taking a, a workshop, this workshop on the road around the world to help educate local photojournalists in what it takes to be a documentary photographer and a news photographer. So the Foundry Photojournalism Workshop is in a different country every year. It's um, maybe 15 instructors or so and we have about a week to instruct students in locating, shooting, editing, and presenting a photo story of some sort. It's a really intense um, process and the students put a lot of heart into it and we try to make this workshop affordable to local photographers so there's a discount rate for local young local photographers with a limited amount of experience we always get a lot of Americans and Europeans and really it's becoming quite an international collection of people who spend a week intensely talking about and thinking about photography it's a really wonderful process. It's a great thing to be a part of. So I, hi I highly recommend it to students who are looking for, or even some beginner professionals who are looking for feedback and a sense of community that they can draw on in the future. And where will it be held in 2011? Yeah, next year in 2011 the workshop will be in South America. I think we're, we're trying to choose exactly which city. Um, I think we're looking at Buenos Aires, but we're not certain yet. It will be announced on their website. At the Foundry Photojournalism Workshop, you put a top 10 list on uh, Vimeo, and number seven said, remember who you are and why you are doing this. So my question to you, Kale, is why are you doing what you do? Why are you documenting these things all over the world? Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? And specifically, do you have a statement, sort of like James Noctway has a credo of some kind, some kind of statement saying, this is what I hope to accomplish with my photography? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough question. I, I think I understand why I do it, but I couldn't distill it to a statement, um, except maybe that I, I never want to stop learning. I'm really, I'm really a curious person, and I'm curious about, uh, particularly about the rest of the world or whatever's happening outside of my own sphere of experience. So for me, photojournalism is, is really just the expression of a lifelong curiosity in what other people experience and how people live in other places. Um, but increasingly I would say, you know, we're, we're facing a lot of really um, enormous challenges as a species in the coming years. I mean, everything from, you know, conflicts and, and water, limitation of water resources and climate change. I mean, the, the list is really daunting. And I feel like as a photojournalist, um, I, I'm allowed to address these really big questions and try to help 
bring perspective to, to audiences who are willing to engage with those questions. So for me, it's an it's incredibly powerful tool and mechanism by which I can sort of confront the world head on and try to bring a little bit of insight for myself and for other people um, on how, how to live better and maybe how to solve some of the problems that we are, we are facing. Well, that's, that's very encouraging. And I, we also have some questions that came in from Twitter. So um, I'd like to ask those of you really fast. So one that came in said, what is the limit to editing photos for a photojournalist? And I think they're talking specifically about Photoshop work for uh, pictures you take as a photojournalist. That's a good question. I usually describe this to, um, to beginners in photojournalism as a contract between the audience and ourselves. As a documentary photographer, we, our contract with our audience is to present what we see without it being digitally altered or changed in some way that makes the scene unrecognizable. <clears throat> you know, when we, <clears throat> excuse me, when we, whatever we see and, and collect, that should be what we, we communicate to people. In Photoshop, I don't make things disappear. I don't use the um, eraser tool to um, remove things from photographs. That's sort of like the biggest no-no. I even don't um, alter the colors and the and the the sort of the dodging and burning in my pictures so that things can be like eliminated or or become completely obscured. I try not to do that. I try to present to viewers what I saw in a, in a realistic depiction of what I saw without changing it unrecognizably. Okay, we have another question that came in and it says, spe specifically talking about your time in Iraq, did you have to lie or convince people in letting you be there or were you welcome as a photographer uh, documenting the war? I was certainly not always welcome. That's <laughs> Photojournalists are often very unwelcome and it takes some convincing and finessing to get ourselves into some of the situations we, we get into. But I personally, I think it's important to avoid lying because people are very perceptive. And um, when I lie, two things happen. One, they can kind of tell and it makes them trust me less and it's their trust that I need. I really, I, if without people's trust or the trust of my subjects, it would be even dangerous for me in some situations. So I try not to lie for that reason, and I also try not to lie because um, I can get busted <laughs> pretty easily, and then that and that can become a very big problem for people, and it just it changes the character of my relationship with them. I mean, I try to be as honest as I can about my motivations, and generally it's pretty easy because even if I don't agree with somebody, I tend to be interested in the way they see the world. So I, I try not to lie. Sometimes, though, if my life depends on it and someone asks me at a checkpoint if I'm American, I will definitely not tell them. <laughs> so you have to be smart, you know. I mean, I'm not going to put myself in, in terrible jeopardy if it's someone I'm just passing or if I, I have to protect myself, I won't tell them exactly the truth. But I try to be pretty honest. And I often do tell people, you know, where I am, where I'm coming from, and what I'm doing there and who I work for so that I can gain their trust. Well, one more question, and that is, and this is the number one question we've seen so far, and that is, how do I get started in photojournalism? What kind of training do I need? Well, increasingly, uh, photojournalists need to be able to do more than only take still pictures. I think good training in photojournalism involves being trained as a reporter in some way. I mean, in the actual, the ethics and the, um, the skill set that you need to be a reporter. I think you need to be able to use your your camera well, you should be able to shoot video, you should be able to collect um, quality sound at this point, and maybe even more importantly than all those sort of technical and vocational things, I think it's important to get some kind of an education in something besides journalism. I always tell journalism students that they should get a minor or maybe double major in something else, study politics or history or language or literature. I think it's valuable just to know something about the world before you go out there and try to report on it. And you know, the older you get, the more you learn and the more you know about the world, but in the meantime, you kind of need a crash course in wherever you're going and ideally get some depth of education in some other subject. Those are very, very insightful words. I wish that we could keep talking because I have about a million more questions that I'd love to ask you, but unfortunately, we're out of time. Thank you so much for joining us today, Kale. Thanks, Mark. It's always a pleasure talking to you. 
Well, you can see all of Kale's work at the Adorama Learning Center. You can see links to her uh, photography on embedded.net. You can see more information about the Foundry uh, Photojournalism Workshop, as well as some of the sneak peeks of her work in uh, southeast Louisiana. And as always, if you have questions for us, please send those to me at askmark at adorama.com. Thanks for joining us, and I'll see you next week. This episode is brought to you by Adorama TV. Visit the Adorama Learning Center where you'll find photography tips and techniques, links to the gear used in this episode, and related videos. For all the latest photography, video, and computer gear, visit Adorama.com. And the next time you're in New York City, visit our store located on 18th Street between 5th and 6th Avenue.